Howdy guys, Jimmy Song here. Welcome to an episode of White Paper Wednesday. It's a show where I read through certain papers and uh, describe to you exactly what it means. Um, I've been doing Nick Sabo shelling out uh, for the last few weeks and uh, and hopefully I can finish it today. It's a pretty long paper, but it's well worth it and it describes just so many things about how money comes to evolve and so on. So that is what we're going to do. So without further ado, let's get straight to it. Um, the link for this is from uh, Nakamoto Institute, and uh, you can find it in the, uh, right below in the show notes. So uh, please take a look at it, read along if you want. Otherwise, just listen and, uh, and hopefully this will make sense to you. All right, so the first two parts uh, talked a lot about uh, sort of the evolutionary advantages of <clears throat> Uh, of tribes specializing in a particular kind of megafauna uh, or you know animals that they can uh, they they knew how to hunt and then uh, trade those uh, with collectibles or family heirlooms and things like that so um, this is diving deep more into how that continues and how uh, these collectibles, which are essentially pre, uh, proto money, uh, as, uh, become uh, this this thing that's used uh, for all sorts of stuff. Um, so we're we're at the section the family trade, an early and in, and important example of a small closed loop trade network made possible by collectibles involves a much higher investment humans make in raising offspring than our primitive relatives, and the related human institution of marriage. Combining arrangements of long-term matches for mating and child raising, negotiated between clans with wealth transfer, marriage is a human universal and probably dates back to the first Homo sapiens sapiens. Parental investment is a long-term and almost one-shot affair. There is no time for repeated interactions. Divorce from a negligent father or unfaithful wife usually represented several years of time, time wasted in genetic fitness terms by the jilted party. Fidelity and commitment to the children were primarily enforced by in-laws, the clan. Marriage was the contract between clans that usually incl included such promises of fidelity and commitment as well as wealth transfer. The contributions a man and a woman will bring to a marriage are seldom equal. This was even more true in an era when mate choice was largely determined by clans and the population from which clan leaders could choose was quite small. Most commonly, the woman was con uh, considered more valuable and the groom's clan paid a bride price to the bride's clan. Quite rare in comparison was dowry, a payment by the bride's clan to the new couple. Mostly this was practiced by upper classes of monogamous but highly unequal societies in medieval Europe and India and was ultimately motivated by the far greater reproductive potential of upper class sons than upper class daughters in those societies. Since literature was mostly written about upper classes, dowry often plays a role in European traditional stories. This does not reflect its actual frequency across human cultures. It was quite rare. So, uh, you know, Nick Sabo is uh, is bringing this back uh, to uh, <clears throat> to marriage and uh, all all of these other institutions, uh, and uh, you know, wealth transfer being a a, a big part of it. Marriages between clans could form a closed cycle of collectibles. Indeed, two clans exchanging partners would be sufficient to maintain a closed loop, as long as brides tended to alternate. If one clan was wealthier in collectibles from some other kind of transfer, it could marry more of its sons to better brides in monogamous societies, or a greater number of brides in polygamous societies. In a loop involving only marriages, primitive money would simply serve to replace the need for money, memory, and trust between clans over a long period of delay between unbalanced transfers of reproductive resources. In other words, uh, the collectible served as sort of like clan money, um, you know, to uh, essentially uh, expand their gene pool a little bit and uh, and get more access to reproductive resources, as uh, Nick Sabo is saying. Like inheritance, lawsuit, and tribute, marriage requires a triple coincidence of the event. In this case, 
marriage, uh, the marriage with supply and demand. Without a transferable and durable store of value, the current ability of a groom's clan to supply the current desires of the bride's clan to a large enough degree to make up the value mismatch between bride and groom, while also satisfying the political and romantic constraints of the match, were quite unlikely to be well satisfied. One solution is imposing an ongoing service obligation from the groom or his clan to the bride's clan. This occurs in about 15% of known cultures. In a much larger number, 67%, the groom or groom's clan pays the bride's clan a substantial amount of wealth. Some of this bride price is paid in immediate consumables, in plants to be gathered, harvested, and animals slaughtered for the marriage feast. In herding or agricultural societies, much of the bride price is paid in livestock, a long-lasting form of wealth. The balance, and usually the most valuable portion of the bride price in cultures without livestock, is paid with what are usually the most valuable family heirlooms. The rarest costliest and most durable pendants, rings, and so on. The Western practice of the groom giving the bride a ring and a suitor ma giving a maiden other kinds of jewelry was once a substantial transfer of wealth and was common in many other cultures. In about 23% of cultures, mostly modern ones, there is no substantial wealth exchange. In about 6% of cultures, there is mutual exchange of substantial wealth between bride and groom clans. In only about 2% of cultures does the bride's clan pay the new couple a dowry. Unfortunately, some wealth transfers were a far cry from the altruism of the inheritance gift or the joy of marriage. Quite the opposite in the case of tribute. So, wealth transfer is very uh, useful in marriage because you might have an imbalance of ma male and female. Also, you might want some genetic diversity in your clan. So, um, being able to get some of uh, get more people into your clan required some of that. Otherwise, you'd have to have some sort of coincidence of wants, which is what Nick is uh, talking about here. Um, and but uh, but yeah, a large part of the bride price, or uh, you know, uh, what what the groom's clan paid to the bride's clan was uh was in collectibles of some kind um and yeah that's that's that in itself is very interesting the spoils of war death rates from violence and chimp troops and hunter gatherer human cultures alike are far higher than in modern civilizations this probably dates at least as far back to as our own our common ancestor with the chimpanzees chimp troops as well are constantly fighting Warfare involved, among other things, killing, maiming, torture, kidnapping, rape, and the extortion of tribute in exchange for avoiding such fates. When two neighboring tribes were not at war, one was usually paying tribute to the other. Tribute could also serve to bind alliances, achieving economies of scale in warfare. Mostly, it was a form of exploitation more lucrative to the victor than furtive, uh, further violence against the defeated. Victory in war was sometimes followed by an immediate payment from the losers to the winners. Often this just took the form of looting by the enthusiastic victors while the losers desperately hid their collectibles. More often, tribute was demanded on a regular basis. In this case, the triple coincidence could and sometimes was avoided by a sophisticated schedule of payments in kind that matched the losing tribe's ability to supply a good or service with the victor's demand for it. However, even with this solution, primitive money could provide a better way, a common medium of value that greatly simplified the terms of payment. A very, very important in an era when terms of the treaty could not be recorded but had to be memorized. In some cases, as with the wampum as used in the Iroquois Confederacy, the collectibles doubled as a primitive mnemonic device that, while not verbatim, could be used as an aid to recall the terms of the treaty. For the winners, collectibles provided a way to collect tribute at closer to the Laffer Optimum. For the losers, collectibles buried in caches provided a way to under-report, leading the victors to believe the losers were less wealthy and thus demanded less than they might. Caches of collectibles also provided insurance against overzealous tribute collectors. Much of the wealth in primitive societies escaped the notice of the missionaries and anthropologists due to its highly secretive nature. 
Only archaeology can reveal the existence of this hidden wealth. In other words, when you can hide the wealth that you have, you can you can play things a little bit better and uh, do things to your advantage, which uh, which uh, which every tribe wanted to do. Hiding and other strategies present, presented a problem that tribute collectors share with modern tax collectors. How to estimate the amount of wealth they can extract. Value measurement is a thorny problem in many kinds of transactions, but never more so than in the antagonistic collection of tax or tribute. In making these very difficult and non-intuitive trade-offs, and then executing them in a series of queries, audits, and collection actions, tribute collectors efficiently optimize their revenue, even if the results seem quite wasteful to the tribute payer. So um, that's an interesting way of looking at tax collection. It's a, it, it's a form of tribute, uh, uh, a way of extracting resources from you at the threat of violence, uh, which is actually very, not very far from what the government does to us. Imagine a tribe collecting tribute from several neighbor tribes previously defeated in war. It must estimate how much it can extract from each tribe. Bad estimates leave the wealth of some tribes understated while forcing others to pay tribute based on estimates of wealth they don't actually have. The result, the tribes that are hurt tend to shrink. The tribes that benefit pass, pay less tribute than could be extracted. In both cases, less revenue is generated for the victors than they might be able to get with better rules. This is an application of the Laffer curve to the fortunes of specific tribes. On this curve, applied to e income taxes by the brilliant economist Arthur Laffer, as the tax rate increases, the amount of revenue increases, but at an increasingly slower rate than the tax rate, due to increased avoidance, evasion, and most of all, disincentive to engage in the tax activity. At a certain rate, due to these reasons, the tax revenues are optimized. Hiking the tax rate beyond the, uh, beyond the Laffer optimum results in lower rather than higher revenues for the government. Ironically, the Laffer curve was used by advocates for lower taxes, even though it is a theory of tax collection optimum to, the, to government revenue, not a theory of tax collection optimal to social welfare or individual preference satisfaction. Um, so yeah, the Laffer curve is basically the idea that you know, as you increase taxes, you, you only get to a certain optimum and then you start having decreased revenues as a result of a high tax rate. Um, and you, you see this uh, in many societies today. Um, on a large scale, the Laffer curve may be the most important economic law of political history. Charles Adams uses it to explain the rise and fall of empires. The most successful governments have been implicitly guided by their own incentives. Both their short-term desire for revenue and their long-term success against other governments to optimize their revenues according to the Laffer curve. Governments that overburdened their taxpayers, such as the Soviet Union and later Roman Empire, ended up on the dust heap of history while governments that collected below the optimum were often conquered by their better funded neighbors. Democratic governments may maintain high tax revenues over historical time by more peaceful means than conquering underfunded states. They are the first states in history with tax revenues so high relative to external threats that they have the luxury of spending most of the money in non-military areas. Their tax regimes have operated closer to the Laffer optimum than those of, the, of most previous kinds of governments. Alternatively, this luxury may be made possible by the efficiency of nuclear weapons in deterring attack rather than the increased incentives of democracies to optimize tax collection. When we apply the Laffer curve to examining the relative impact of treaty uh, tribute, ter tribute terms, on various tribes, we conclude that the desire to optimize revenues causes victors to want to accurately measure the income and wealth of the vanquished. Measuring value is crucial to determining the tributary's incentives to avoid or evade the tribute by hiding wealth, fight, or flight. For their part, tributaries can and do spoof these measurements in various ways, for example, by burying collectibles and caches. 
Tribute collection involves a measurement game with unaligned incentives. So uh, what, what he's arguing here is that there's an optimum and democratic societies tend to get to that optimum, uh, maybe as a result of a lack of war or something like that. With collectibles, one can demand tribute at strategically optimal times instead of when items can be supplied by the tributary or is in demand by the victor. The victors can then choose when they will in the future consume the wealth rather than having to consume it at the time the tribute is extracted. Much later, well into the dawn of history in 700 BC, though trade was widespread, money still took the form of collectibles made out of more precious metals, but in their basic characteristics, such as lack of uniform value, similar to most of the proto-money used since the dawn of Homo sapiens sapiens. This was changed by a Greek-speaking culture in Anatolia, modern Turkey, the Lydians. Specifically, the kings of Lydia were the first major issuers of coins in the archaeological and historical record. From that day to this, government mints with self-granted monopolies rather than private mints have been the main issuers of coin. Why wasn't minting dominated by private interests such as private bankers, which did exist at the time in these semi-market economies? The main explanation for government dominance of coin minting has been that only governments could enforce anti-counterfeiting measures. However, they could have enforced such measures in protection of competing private mints just as they enforce trademarks today and at that time as well. It was far easier to estimate the value of a coin than that of a collectible, especially at low transaction values. Far more trades could be made with money instead of barter. Indeed, many kinds of low-value trades became possible for the first time as the first small gains from trade for the first time exceeded transaction costs. Collectibles were low-velocity money involved in a num small number of high-value transactions. Coins were high-velocity money uh, facilitating a large number of low-value trades. Given what we have seen about the benefits of proto-money to tribute and co tax collectors, as well as the critical nature of the value measurement problem and optimally coercing such payments, it is not surprising that tax collectors, specifically the kings of Lydia, were the first major issuers of coinage. The king, deriving his revenue from tax collection, had a strong incentive to measure the value of wealth held and exchanged by his subjects more accurately. That the exchange also benefited from cheaper measurement by traders of the medium of exchange, creating something closer to efficient markets and allowing individuals to enter into the marketplace on a larger scale for the first time, was for the king a fortuitous side effect. The greater wealth flowing through markets now available to be taxed boosted the king's revenues even beyond the normal laffer curve effect of reducing mismeasurement between given tax sources. So it was really motivated probably by the desire to collect an accurate amount of tribute or tax from, um, from uh, the Lydian king's subjects. Uh, but what actually ended up happening was that it also spurred commerce and uh, made money become a lot more high velocity or create more trade. This combination of more efficient tax collection with more efficient markets meant the vast increase in overall tax revenues. The tax collectors almost literally hit a gold mine, and the wealth of Lydian kings, Midas, Croesus, and Gyges is famous to this day. Uh, you're, you're, I'm sure you've heard of uh, the Midas touch. That's where it comes from. A few centuries later, the Greek king Alexander the Great conquered Egypt, Persia, and much of India, funding his spectacular conquest by plundering Egyptian and Persian temples, filled with assemblages of low-velocity collectibles and melting them down into high-velocity coins. More efficient and encompassing market economies, as well as more efficient tax collection, sp sprung up in his wake. Tribute payments did not form by themselves a closed loop of collectibles. These were only valuable if they ultimately could be used by the victors for something else, such as marriage, trade, or collateral. However, victors could coerce the vanquished into manufacturing for obtaining collectibles, even if it did not serve the vanquished voluntary interests. So, um, you know, war and uh, fighting and 
tax collection these things all led to sort of the system that we saw in the ancient world and eventually to today disputes and remedies ancient hunter gatherers did not have our modern tort or criminal law but they did have an analogous means of settling disputes often judged by clan or tribal leaders or vote that covered what modern law calls crimes and torts settling disputes through punishments or payment sanctions payment sanctioned by the clans of the disputing party substituted for cycles of revenge or vendetta wars most pre-modern cultures ranging from the iroquois in america to the pre-christian germanic peoples decided that payment was better than punishment prices the german weregeld and iroquois blood money were assigned to all actionable offenses ranging from petty theft to rape to murder where money was available the payment took the form of money livestock was used in herding cultures otherwise payment of collectibles were, were the most commonly used remedy the payment of remedies for damages in a lawsuit or similar complaint led to the same kind of problem of triple coincidence of event supply and demand as occurred in inheritance marriage and tribute the judgment of the case had to coincide with the ability of the plaintiff to pay the damages as well as the opportunity and desire of the defendant to benefit from them if the remedy was consumable the plaintiff already had plenty of the remedy still served as a punishment but would not likely satisfy the dependent and thus would not curb the cycle of violence Thus, we hear again the va uh, value added by collectibles, in this case, in making possible the remedy to resolve a dispute or terminate a cycle of revenge. Dispute remedies would not form a closed loop if the payment served to entirely eliminate vendettas. However, if the payment did not completely dampen the vendetta, the payments could form a cycle forming, uh, following the cycle of revenge. For this reason, it is possible that institution reached uh, that the institution reached an equilibrium when it had reduced but not eliminated cycles of revenge until the advent of more densely connected trading networks so you know uh the the famous uh thing uh with revenge is the hatsfields and mccoys right like they they started murdering each other and then they uh they eventually stopped but that that's kind of the idea of this um the cycle of violence if, if you can remedy it with some sort of collectible or money that's uh that that makes it all that much better attributes of collectibles since humans involved evolved a small in small largely self-sufficient and mutually antagonistic tribes the use of collectibles to reduce the need for favor tracking and to make possible the other human institutions of wealth transfer we have explored <clears throat> What's far more important than the scale problems of barter for most of the time span of our species. Indeed, collectibles provided a fundamental improvement to the workings of reciprocal altruism, allowing humans to cooperate in ways of unavailable to other species. For them, reciprocal altruism is severely limited by unreliable memory. Some other species have large brains, build their own homes, or make and use tools. No other species has proved, uh, produced such an improvement to the workings of reciprocal altruism. The evidence indicates this new development had matured by 40,000 BP. Menger called this um, uh, first money an intermediate commodity, what this paper calls collectibles. An artifact useful for other things such as cutting could also be used as a collectible. However, once institutions involving uh, wealth transfer became valuable, collectibles would be manufactured just for their collectible properties. What are these properties? For a particular commodity to be chosen as a valuable collectible, it would have had, relative to products less valuable as collectibles, at least the following desirable qualities. More secure from accidental loss and theft. For most of history, this meant carryable on the person and easy to hide. Harder to forge its value, an important subset of these are products that are unforgeably costly and therefore considered valuable for reasons explained below. This value was more accurately approximated by simple observations or measurements. These observations would have had more reliable integrity yet have been less expensive. 
Humans the world over are strongly motivated to collect items that better satisfy these properties. Some of this motivation probably includes genetically evolved instincts. Such objects are collected for the sheer pleasure of collecting them, not for any particular good, explicit, and proximate reasons. And such pleasure is nearly universal across human cultures. One of the immediate proximate motivations is decoration. According to Dr. Mary C. Steiner, an archaeologist at the University of Arizona, ornamentation is universal among all modern human foragers. For an evolutionary psychologist, such a behavior that has a good ultimate explanation in terms of natural selection has, but has no proximate rationale other than pleasure, is a prime candidate to be genetically evolved, uh, to be a genetically evolved pleasure that motivates the behavior. Such is, if the reasoning in this essay is correct, the human instinct to collect rare items, art, and especially jewelry. There is sort of an inborn instinct to collect rare things, pretty things, things that are attractive. Um, and attractive things uh, tend to have these qualities that uh, Nick Sabo is talking about. Point two requires some further explanation. At first, the production of a commodity simply because it is quite costly seems quite wasteful. However, the unforgeably costly commodity repeatedly adds value by enabling beneficial wealth transfers. More of the cost is recouped every time a transaction is made possible or made less expensive. The cost, initially a complete waste, is amortized over many transactions. The monetary value of precious metals is based on this principle. It also applies to collectibles, which are more prized the rarer they are and the less forgeable the, uh, this rarity is. It also applies where provably skilled or unique human labor is added to the product as with art. We have never discovered or made a product that does really well on all three scores. Art and collectibles in the sense that word is used in modern culture rather in the technical sense it is used in this paper, optimize two but not one or three. Common beads satisfy one, and one but not two or three. Jewelry made at first out of the most beautiful and less common shells but eventually in many cultures out of precious metals comes closer to satisfying all three properties. It is no coincidence that precious metal jewelry usually come in thin forms such as chains and rings, allowing for inexpensive assaying at randomly chosen locations. Coins were a further improvement, substituting small standard weights and trademarks for assays greatly reduced the cost of small transactions using precious metals. Money proper was just a further step in the evolution of collectibles. The kind of mobile art also made by Paleolithic man, small figurines and the like, also matches these characteristics well. Indeed, Paleolithic man made a few objects that were uh, not either utilitarian or shared characteristics one through three. So just to review, the three properties are more secure from accidental loss and theft, uh, carryable on a person that is, harder to forge its value, um, like very hard to uh, counterfeit it, essentially. Uh, and it, it should be simply observable and measurable. Um, just to know, Bitcoin fits all three. There are many puzzling instances of useless or at least unused flints with hum Homo sapiens. We have uh, mentioned the unusable flints of the Clovis people. Kulif discusses a European Mesolithic era find of hundreds of flints, carefully crafted, but which micrograph analysis reveals were never used for cutting. Flints were quite likely the first collectibles preceding special purpose collectibles like jewelry. Indeed, the first flint collectibles would have been made for their cutting of the utility. Their added value as a medium of wealth transfer was a fortuitous side effect that enabled the institutions described in this article to blossom. These institutions in turn would have motivated the manufacture of special purpose collectibles. At first, flints that, had, that need, no, need have no actual use as cutting tools, then the wide variety of other kinds of collectibles that were developed by Homo sapiens sapiens. During the Neolithic era in many parts of the Middle East and Europe, some kinds of jewelry became more standardized, to the point where standard sizes and assayability were often valued over beauty. In commercial areas, the quantity of this jewelry sometimes greatly exceeded that of traditional jewelry in hoards. This is an intermediate step between jewelry and coins when some collectibles increasingly took a fungible form. 
Around 700 BC, the Lydian king started issuing coins as described above. The unforgeable costliness of standard weights of precious metals could now be assayed in a marketplace by wage earners or by tax collectors via trademark. Trust in the mint's brand instead of chopping coiled wire at a randomly selected spot. It is no coincidence that the attributes of collectibles are shared with precious metals, coins, and the reserve commodities that have backed most non-fiat currencies. Money proper implemented these properties a purer form than the collectibles used during almost all of human history. So what you're seeing are, uh, you know, sort of necklaces or proto jewelry or whatever. Um, and uh, the main thing is that collectibles functioned as money, essentially, and uh, for good reason. Silver ring and coil money from Sumer, 2500 BC. Note the standard size of cross, uh, of cross sections. Most of these pieces had a standard weight ranging from one twelfth of a shekel to 60 shekels. To assay a ring or a coil, it could be weighed and cut at, a random, at random locations. A novelty of the 20th century was the issue of fiat currencies by government. Fiat means not backed by any reserve commodity as the gold and silver based con, uh, currencies of previous centuries were. While generally excellent as a media of exchange, fiat currencies have proven to be very poor stores of value. Inflation has destroyed many a nest egg. It is no coincidence that markets and rare objects and unique artwork, usually sharing the attributes of collectibles described above, have enjoyed a renaissance during the last century. One of, the most, one of our most advanced high-tech marketplaces, eBay, is centered around these objects of primordial economic qualities. The collectibles market is larger than ever, even if the fraction of our wealth invested in them is smaller than when they were crucial to evolutionary success. Collectibles both satisfy our instinctive urges and remain useful in their ancient role as a secure store of value. So collectibles are proto-money, um, and, uh, and it's coming back in part because of fiat money, um, and this is something I've observed as well. Conclusion, many kinds of wealth transfers, one-way and mutual, voluntary and coerced, face transaction costs. In voluntary trades, both parties gain. A, free, a truly free gift is usually an act of kin altruism. These transactions create value for one or both parties as much as the physical act of making something. Tribute benefits the victor and a judgment of damages can prevent further violence as well as benefiting the victim. Inheritance made humans the first animals to pass wealth to their next generation kin. These heirlooms could in turn be used as collateral or payment and trade for goods, for food to stave off starvation, or to pay a marriage bride price. Whether the costs of making these transfers, transaction costs, are low enough to make the transfers worthwhile is another matter. Collectibles were crucial in making these kinds of transactions possible for the first time. Collectibles augmented our large brains and language, language as solutions to the prisoner's dilemma that ke keeps almost all animals from cooperating via delayed reciprocation with non-kin. Reputational beliefs can uh, suffer from two major kinds of errors. Errors of about which person did what and errors in appraising the value or damages caused by the act. Within clans, the small and immediately local kin group or extended family, which formed a subset of a tribe, our large brains could minimize these errors so that public reputation and coercive sanctions superseded the limited motivation provided by the counterparty's ability to cooperate or defect in the future as the main enforcer of delayed reciprocation. In both Homo sapien neanderthalensis and Homo sapien sapiens with the same large brain size, it is quite likely that every local clan member kept track of everybody, uh, everybody other uh, local clan members' favors. The use of collectibles for trade within the small local kin group may have been minimal. Between clans within a tribe, both favor tracking and collectibles were used. Between tribes, collectibles entirely replaced reputation as the enforcer of reciprocation, although violence still played a major role in enforcing rights as well as being a high transaction cost that prevented most kinds of trade. 
to be useful as a general purpose store of that wealth and means of wealth transfer, a collectible had to be embedded in at least one institution with a closed loop cycle so that the cost of discovering and or manufacturing the object was amortized over multiple transactions. Furthermore, a collectible was ju not just any kind of beautiful decorative object. It had to have certain functional properties, such as the security of being wearable on the person, compactness for hiding or burial, and unforgeable costliness. That costliness may have been verifiable by the recipient of the transfer using many of the same skills that collectors use to appraise collectibles today. The theories presented in this paper can be tested by looking for these characteristics or the lack of them in the valuables often exchanged in these cultures. By examining the economic gains from the cycles through which these valuables move, and by observing preferences for objects with these characteristics in a wide variety of cultures, including modern ones. With its unprecedented technology of cooperation, humans have had become the most fearsome predator ever seen on the planet. They adapted to a shifting climate while dozens of their large herd prey were driven by hunting and climate change in America, Europe, and Asia to extinction. Today, most large animals on the planet are afraid of projectiles and adaptation to only one species of predator. Cultures based more on gathering uh, than hunting also greatly benefited. A population explosion followed. Homo sapiens sapiens was to populate more parts of the planet and at a, denser, at a density over 10 times that of Homo sapiens neanderthal lenses, despite weaker bones and no increase in brain size. Much of this increase may be attributed to the social institutions made possible by effective wealth transferring language, trade, marriage, inheritance, tri tribute, collateral, and the ability to assess damages to dampen cycles of vengeance. Primitive money was not modern money as we know it. It took on some of the functional money, uh, function money, modern money now performs, but its form was that of heirlooms, jewelry, and other collectibles. The use of these is so ancient that the desire to explore, collect, make, display, appraise, carefully store, and trade collectibles are human universals, to some extent instincts. This constellation of human desires may, might be called the collecting instinct. Searching for the raw materials such as shells and teeth and manufacturing of collectibles took up a considerable portion of many ancient humans' time, just as many modern humans expend substantial resources on these activities as hobbies. The result for our ancient forebearers were the first secure forms of embodied value very different from concrete utility and the forerunner of today's money. All right, so that uh, basically summarizes Nick Sabo shelling out. Uh, essentially, what he's arguing is that, uh, you know, money uh, allowed for cooperation, and cooperation allowed civilization to grow. And, uh, and in order to do that, you had to have some sort of collectible, and the collectible became, uh, you know, had to be durable and so on. So a lot of the things that he writes about are... Uh, sort of an evolutionary explanation of why uh, money, uh, you know, why we have the instincts that we do and so on. So, um, you know, it, it's an excellent article, very well thought out and, uh, and you know, a classic for that reason. All right. Uh, I don't see any questions. I wonder if I did like technical analysis, if I would get more viewers, but eh, whatever. Uh, it is what it is. Um, anyway, uh, Fiat Delenda Est, this song is done.